thanks for joining our press conference on reopening CUNY institutions. Uh, just some housekeeping rules. I will be doing some the tech and behind the scenes work. Uh, when we get to the Q&A portion, we will be prioritizing uh, questions from press first. And then we will, if time allows, we will ask some questions from our members and additional guests. So again, we will be part prioritizing questions from press first. So if you are press, it would be really great if you can identify yourself as press in your, your title so we know the outlet that you're from in case we have to follow up with you with any uh, information or send out the recording. So again, we will be focusing on press first. And if we have any additional time, we will be moving on to members and additional guests. And please identify that you are a press person in your, uh, your title. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you here. I'm Barbara Bowen. I'm a professor at the City University of New York, and I'm president of the Professional Staff Congress CUNY. And we represent the 30,000 faculty and staff uh, who work at the City University of New York. We're going to hear from some of them today, and we're very pleased that we have legislative and elected leaders who are supporting us in this very important um, press conference today and announcement, and we'll be hearing from them in a moment. Uh, but first, I wanted to say a few words about why we are here. Um, the start of the semester at CUNY is less than a week away, and the Professional Staff Congress has still not been provided with the finalized reopening plans for all the CUNY colleges. We are here because as the union president and on behalf of the members, I am calling on the CUNY administration not to open any work site until that work site can be demonstrated to be safe and free from recognized hazards. CUNY has an obligation under the law to provide a workplace that's free from recognized hazards and COVID-19 is clearly a recognized hazard. Uh, we have not received the plans from CUNY. Uh, we know that the whole city, everyone here, we see uh, uh, Deborah Glick in Albany, we, we know that the whole city is focused, the whole country is focused on safety in reopening. And the last thing any of us want in New York is to have a resurgence of the horrible epicenter, the horrible pandemic that we lived through and are continuing to live through, and a pandemic that disproportionately ravaged the lives of the CUNY student communities. That is the last thing we want to see. And unfortunately, CUNY's plans are still, as far as we know, still being finalized. And CUNY has specific problems with their buildings because there are many buildings <clears throat> all across the city. And many of them had severe uh, problems with ventilation even before the pandemic. They had other health hazards, which CUNY insufficiently addressed. And um, we'll hear later on from a professor who's gonna speak about the science a bit more, um, but it's been clear through really mounting evidence that the a primary concern about transmission of COVID is about aerosol transmission. Um, and that to, to prevent aerosol transmission, um, cleaning surfaces, even wearing PPE, even uh, social distancing is not enough. The key is good ventilation. We have CUNY buildings that have suffered from decades of underfunding and racialized austerity. And that is being borne out now as those buildings already had so many problems and we are, and they were not thoroughly addressed. We are, have been provided with no proof yet that those buildings have been made safe. And our members, are in completely dedicated to their work. They believe in CUNY, they're here because of CUNY, and they've done huge amounts of extra work to be able to transform our teaching, our support for students in these circumstances. But we should not have to risk our lives to go to work. CUNY has announced that the majority of classes will be conducted remotely, 94%. Um, and the majority of employees will be working remotely. But under their estimates, there are still maybe 1,000 faculty, including full-time and part-time faculty, and maybe 10,000 or more uh, professional staff or staff employees in all the categories um, who could be working on campus. The numbers may not be that high, but even one person exposed to COVID risk in this, in this crisis, in this moment, is one too many. 
CUNY already holds the sad distinction of having lost more faculty and staff to COVID-19 than any university in the country. We are in a city that has been the epicenter of this virus. Our students, many of whom, and you'll hear from a student later, many of whom are frontline workers, essential workers throughout this, and many live in communities that still have higher than average uh, infection rates and unacceptably high infection rates. Um, given these circumstances, the CUNY administration should be hyper vigilant, hyper vigilant about ensuring safe conditions. There may be some campuses where the conditions are safe. Um, there are campuses on which the um, union representatives, and you'll hear from Giovanni Piquant later about students, were engaged in developing the reopening plans. Just as a reminder, the New York State guidelines require, don't just recommend, but require that the reopening plans should reflect engagement with faculty, staff, students, and unions. Many of the plans at CUNY do not reflect this engagement. And without either the engagement or the final plan or the proof that we can be safe in those buildings, we are demanding that CUNY not open any work site until that work site can be proven to be safe. I'll just say a few more things uh, and then I want to talk about one urgent instance. Many of our members uh, are eager to re resume their work in research labs, in other studios and hands-on work that we do at CUNY. And also we all understand the urgency of serving our students in this moment. I mean, CUNY is more important now than ever. And we also understand the particular importance of hands-on learning in certain disciplines, training for dental technology, training to be an EMT. Uh, we understand those things and we are eager to serve our students at particularly this economic moment. We believe it's possible to conduct uh, some of that work safely, but we have not yet been provided the proof that it is safe. And until that's provided, we cannot say that it is all right for CUNY to call people back to work, even one person. I, 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 we don't yet either have a fully negotiated procedure for accommodations for people who are at high risk if they do contract COVID-19, and we are demanding that that be in place by August 26, which is Wednesday of next week, before classes resume. And I want to talk in, uh, just at the end about one especially urgent need. Um, this is at the Hunter College campus schools. The PSC proudly represents the K through 12 teachers in the Hunter College campus schools, which are um, administered by Hunter College. And this is perhaps our most urgent situation. Um, they are scheduled to go back and it's not only 6% of classes. Uh, the administration has not yet made clear what percentage of classes are supposed to be conducted in person. Um, so, but there will be far more and we suspect the majority, they're calling for the majority of students, including kindergartners, six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, teenagers to be back in uh, in-person classes. The biggest issue is the building itself. The Hunter College campus schools are built on the site of a former armory, and some of you may know what they, it looks like, and it's built to resemble an armory. It has almost no windows and little slit windows, huge brick walls, and very, very little ventilation. It was in a ventilation crisis before the pandemic struck. And we, the repairs and the upgrading of the systems at the Hunter campus schools have not yet been completed. And yet the plan that's been announced to the teachers is that oh, they should go back to in-person work and the testing of the brand new systems will be conducted while they're right there and while the students are there. That is completely irresponsible and completely unnecessary. The Hunter Campus Schools teachers, it's a wonderful school, uh, school where the teachers are incredibly creative, the students are incredibly uh, devoted and we'll hear from alumnus from an alum in a minute. Um, it's a school that really did exciting things with remote teaching. We are demanding that that school not open for in-class, in-person work until at least Thanksgiving and until an independent inspection can show definitively that the building has been made safe. Um, this is about all of us. This is about CUNY. This is a, we're at the uh, college, the university in the center of the pandemic for so long. It's in everyone's interest to get this right 
and do it now and not to put people in harm's way and risk of death to do something that we could do well and do remotely. So we are demanding that CUNY take action before Wednesday when classes are started, uh, um, scheduled to start. Thank you very much. Um, and now I will have the pleasure of calling I, on our first, I know Deborah Glick is on a short time frame, but uh, so we'll make sure we get to hear from you, Deborah, who's the chair of higher education um, at the uh, New York State Assembly. Uh, we'll start with Professor Jean Grassman, who is a health and safety expert and will help to contextualize for us. Um, Jean. You're muted, Jean. Oops, Jean, unmute. Okay, looks like I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. Okay, um, at any rate, uh, good afternoon and thank you to Barbara for the introduction. Um, I'm Jean Grassman and an associate professor at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. By trade, I'm an industrial hygienist, which means I specialize in workplace health and safety. As a PSC health and safety coordinator for more than 10 years, I've witnessed firsthand the state of CUNY's 25 campuses. According to their own website, the average age of a CUNY building is nearly 50 years old, and at least 50 buildings were constructed before 1929. Years of austerity and deferred maintenance have not been kind to the more than 300 structures. These buildings have always been a challenge to their users over the years. September heat waves caused students and faculty to overheat in their classrooms. During winter freezes, sections of HVAC systems have broken uh, and flooded entire floors. And throughout the year, the roofs and the risers which carry water within the building leak and the resultant mold sickens our members and students. So within these structures, CUNY faculty, staff, and students have dealt with the pandemic for over five months now. And having lost more colleagues than any other university in the country, we know what coronavirus can do. The scientific understanding of coronavirus and its transmission have evolved. Here's what we now know. The dominant route of coronavirus transmission is through the air by respiratory aerosols. What that means is we release droplets when we speak, cough, exhale, and sing. Initially, the thinking was that these droplets were so large they would quickly fall due to gravity. And this is the basis for the six-foot guidance for physical distancing. In July, an open letter from 239 prominent scientists summarized recent and compelling evidence that people also emit very small particles called aerosols, which are less affected by gravity and consequently are able to travel many meters. And because aerosols can travel distances, they are easily capable of crossing a typical classroom. In contrast, epidemiological evidence now suggests that contact with objects is not a major route of transmission. This realization has produced the term hygiene theater to describe the monumental efforts that have gone into disinfection. Other common recommendations emphasize physical distancing where the prescribed distances are based on the old assumptions about droplet movement and also presume good ventilation. Face coverings as distinguished from respirators do reduce the release of particles into the environment by the wearer, provided they are used correctly. But how many times do you see somebody's nose sticking out of their face covering? And respirators, such as the N95, protect the wearer, but they continue to be expensive and difficult to find. So what does this shift in thinking mean for us at CUNY? Our contract in the law mandate that the city university and furnish each of its employees a place of employment which is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious harm. Based on the state of the science, the most effective way to prevent coronavirus is to reduce air transmission, and the best way to do that is to enhance ventilation. So we call upon CUNY to take the steps necessary to protect us before we return to work in a building or a site. 
Um, there are some authoritative recommendations out there, such as ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. This is widely recognized as being the best source. They have, based on their guidelines for reopening schools and universities, we expect HVAC systems, that's the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, to operate as if the building is in peak occupancy. These are measures to increase ventilation. Use as much outside air as possible. Increase hours of operation. Use a high level of filtration and open dampers. We need room by room surveys to be done to ensure the level of distancing needed given the level of ventilation. We at the PSC will be delighted to return to the campuses that we love and the students that we love to teach, but we will do so only once we have verification that a building has been made as safe as possible. We demand this because our lives depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, so much. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, uh, well, I know there'll be questions for Jean, but I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker. And we're very pleased to have with us the chair of the New York State Assembly Higher Education Committee, uh, Assembly Member Deborah Glick. Uh, hi, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be with you. I'm very uh, concerned as you are. Uh, I think it's a, it's a big challenge across the country. Uh, the problem for CUNY has been years of um, very limited maintenance uh, dollars, uh, and in some years none, uh, and a large system in substantially older buildings. Uh, there are just a handful of new builds on a few of the campuses, but by and large, uh, you're dealing with uh, older facilities that have not been well maintained. Uh, not because CUNY didn't want to, uh, but because neither the city nor the state provided the, the uh, kind of resources necessary to do that. I think campuses across the country uh, have made determinations that uh, as CUNY has, where the majority of work uh, will be on uh, online, uh, but clearly there are facilities that need to be open. And I applaud you for standing up and demanding that these be uh, safe. Some of the labs are the um, oldest facilities at CUNY, and those are the ones that um, uh, are least likely to have uh, sufficient uh, ventilation to give anyone a level of confidence that they will be uh, safe. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, this uh, presentation today, uh, and apologies if I have to, my phone will alert me when I have to leave, um, uh, that, um, that this presentation will make it clear uh, not just to uh, CUNY, but uh, which is the, the chancellor and the leadership, uh, but also the board, uh, because members of the board have a responsibility and uh, the board is appointed by the mayor and the uh, governor. Uh, and uh, notably the governor's budget director is uh, uh, on the board and has, I think, a, maybe more of a recognition uh, that we have not done in good times what we needed to do. Obviously, uh, without some federal help right now, uh, we're very limited in uh, the resources we have. And um, one hopes that the uh, dire political uh, consequences for some of the uh, senators might make M Mitch McConnell uh, actually sit down and do something. I assume that they are looking to do it as close to the election as they could so they can be called heroes, but we are desperate and people are going to face layoffs uh, within the next month, month and a half if we don't have revenue replacement. But as I said, even in good times, 
even in good times, we did not get the kind of um, support for uh, capital improvements uh, and um, just normal maintenance. So I would hope that uh, today is a clarion call to both uh, CUNY, the mayor, and the governor uh, to ensure the safety, because we can't go back. New York was in the worst position, and we cannot, we cannot see that happen. And of course, the schools are um, looking to reopen, and city schools in many instances are just like CUNY, old buildings, not great ventilation, windows that don't open. Uh, so thank you for pulling this together. And I very much appreciated listening to uh, uh, Jean's um, excellent presentation on what we need to be doing to ensure uh, that this is um, safe for you all. So thank you very much. And I will listen as long as I can. Uh, and apologies that I will have to at some point bolt. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And uh, thank you for your uh, long history of support for us at the PSC and for CUNY students. And we're, we're glad we were able to catch you for this half hour. So, um, and I, I just want to say before introducing our next speaker, um, one thing that I think was pointed to in the earlier comments, uh, this is a health issue. It's a public health, health issue, but it's also a racial justice issue. CUNY student body is 80% people of color. Uh, we cannot in this city, in this country, at this moment, when finally there is some public coming to grips with a history of racist decisions, race, uh, in, in, uh, institutionalized racism, all forms of it, we cannot say that it's okay for a, an urban university that educates largely working class and middle class and poor people of color to take any risk at all, any risk at all, with our students' lives and the lives of people who work with them and teach them. Uh, so this is a racial justice issue at this moment and it's a health issue and it's got tremendous urgency. So we're very pleased that we have the two chairs of the higher education committees for New York State with us. And with that, I'll introduce the chair of the Senate Committee on Higher Education and that's Senator Toby Ann Stavisky. Uh, Senator Stavisky. President Bowen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more with the issue of uh, critical maintenance being insufficient to, uh, to maintain our buildings and our lack of uh, providing the capital resources that we need. But let me add a, a different perspective. When construction occurs and is finished, the people present what is called a punch list. It's a list at the end of the job of things that still have to be done. And I think what we need here is a punch list for reopening the schools uh, and particularly uh, the uh, uh, colleges and universities. Um, Professor Glassman has talked about the buildings themselves and the ventilation and all that we need to make it safe. Um, I think we also, and I think it's crucial that there be some form of testing. Um, if you test for the, the antibodies and the students test positive or the faculty tests positive, great, it's safe. But we've got to continue the testing for the, um, for the virus itself. And I think uh, there have to be um, uh, proper testing guidelines. I know that uh, they've been resistant to using the thermometers and the testing, uh, the lab tests, but I think this is crucial uh, for periodic testing because uh, so many colleges are opening for five minutes, discovering uh, um, it's not safe and that, uh, believe it or not, college students like to party. What a surprise. And the virus develops, and that is just what we don't want to happen. Um, the other point, I think, is that we have to be careful for the people, the staff, 
the, not only the faculty members, but the support staff, as well as the students who decide to come in. Um, interestingly, I held a number of hearings throughout the state, both in the fall and October, there was a hearing at Brooklyn College. Um, and then uh, in December, um, December 16th, there was a hearing at 250 Broadway. Uh, and that hearing dealt with um, some of the capital needs as well. And then we had a, uh, the Assemblywoman and I co-chaired a hearing on July 28th on how we're dealing with the COVID crisis. Um, I must tell you, there was a student at the hearing at 250 Broadway who talked about, there were several students who talked about the deplorable conditions in their respect, I'm not going to name the schools, but what happened was after the hearing, and they provided photographs to their credit, and I sent the photographs both to the college presidents of the deteriorating conditions in these school facilities um, and to the CUNY uh, uh, chancellor, and they did respond. But I remember some of these prefabs from uh, um, the 1970s. I don't think the students today understood how prefabs work. These are prefabricated buildings. They're still there. I've seen them uh, on a number of campuses. Uh, and I'm sure the circulation of air is inadequate. I'm sure it, it is, doesn't have the protective uh, gear available. Um, but I also remember Leaving the Brooklyn College hearing in October uh, of last year and going to the ladies room and the total absence of everything that you need in a ladies room, total. Uh, and this was pre-pandemic. And I think supplies are extremely critical. Supply, if they couldn't supply the, the restroom with hand towels, when we didn't have the crisis, how are they going to do it? Who's going to check to make sure that all of the facilities have what I think should be a 60 day supply um, of both the PPE, but also the masks and the hand sanitizer uh, and everything else that, uh, that we need. Um, it, it seems to me that it is very dangerous what they are proposing to do. Uh, and that the safety of the students, uh, the possibility, what happens if a student um, or a faculty member contract the disease and then they sue? And lo and behold, it's going to cost more to settle that lawsuit than it is to provide the necessary supplies and the equipment and the masks uh, and the PPE. So I thank uh, professional staff, uh, Congress. I know that almost 50 people from the CUNY family, and it is a family, uh, have perished in this epidemic. I think the number should stop there. I'm afraid it's going to increase if we don't plan ahead uh, to prevent it from happening again. So I thank Barbara and everybody from PSC uh, and um, I look forward to listening to what other people have to say. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Senator Stavisky. And uh, yes, thank you for holding those hearings. I'll say that I heard, I was at those hearings mm -hmm. and I heard a student from Medgar Evers College say <laughs> when her mother went to Medgar Evers College, she was learning in a temporary prefab building. And they were told then, this is only temporary. This doesn't show how much we care about and invest in your education. And now the, the daughter is at Medgar Evers. And guess what? She's in the same prefab building, temporary building. That's uh, one I that's was thinking. <laughs> uh, and it's not healthy. Uh, so Barbara, people don't realize the effect that they have at these hearings. Uh, you remember it and I remember it. Yep. Uh, my husband, as you know, taught at uh, Kingsborough when it first opened and it was all prefab and then at uh, Queensborough. Yes. Uh, the, some of the prefabs of Queensborough are still there and it's in my okay. district. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, so now we're very pleased to uh, turn it over to the uh, chair of the City Council Committee on Health, uh, which has been an incredibly active committee, had been before, but has been called to take uh, a huge role in this crisis. And Mark Levine leads that committee and has been especially active uh, advocating for us at CUNY. So we're delighted to have you here, Mark. Uh, welcome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, President Bowen, and wonderful to see my colleagues, uh, Assemblymember Chair Glick, Chair Stavinsky. Um, happy to speak to you as Chair of the City Council Health Committee, and also as a proud CUNY parent. Uh, our son attends City College. And uh, so in that capacity, I want to thank all of the faculty and staff, not just the City College, but the whole CUNY system for what you've done over the last five and a half months. Uh, distance learning is, no matter what anyone thinks, not easy. It is probably even more work for all of you. And you've put in the hours to do everything you can to continue to offer an enriching experience for your students. And I know that's been tough and, and I'm really grateful for that. You know, in my capacity as health chair, I wanna make it clear that the threat of this virus remains all too real in New York City. There's been a misquoted stat this week that the positivity rate dropped to less than one quarter of 1%. That's false. Uh, the positivity rate in New York City remains, uh, as of today, 1.1%, much better than it was in the spring, thank goodness. But to put that in terms of real numbers, 300 new cases a day, every day, consistently, um, probably more than that because of what we're missing. And uh, we, we, we have to be extremely cautious to avoid that blowing up to a rebound this fall. And yes, that means worrying about indoor spaces. Um, the truth is that any setting in which multiple people are in the same indoor space has to be handled with extreme care. And that would include an art studio, a biology lab, a storage room, a bathroom, uh, a, a maintenance area, uh, administrative office suite. Um, we've got to be extremely careful about the conditions there during this time of a pandemic. And so we have to look at air circulation. You know, in a subway car, for example, the air rotates in and out 18 times an hour. In a restaurant, maybe about 12 times an hour. Well, there are parts of CUNY that uh, it might only be four or five times an hour that the air is circulating, and that directly relates to the coronavirus risk. What about filtration? Um, all filters are not created equal. We need sophisticated filters to screen out the virus particles. And so that's why Governor Cuomo, when setting out guidelines for reopening malls, said you gotta have a MERV 13 uh, filter. Uh, you have to have a filter rated at MERV 13 or higher. That, by the way, is also the standard for reopening gems. And, and those are filters that basically, um, they filter out 90% of the small particles. Um, and so that's the standard the state has set. Well, if that's the standard in a mall or a gym, then it should be the standard in an educational space. And I think it was Professor Grassman who said, we got to go room by room, mm -hmm. not building by building. You have to have a room by room analysis to assess uh, these factors for an airborne virus. Um, and it's, it's, uh, that analysis needs to be done by a trusted independent uh, engineering expert. Uh, and I'll just say a word about the, the schools on the Hunter College campus, the K-12 schools, where I think we can all agree uh, that our sensitivity has to be um, at, at, at a maximum level because you have young people coming back in, potentially, for in-person learning. And all the factors I mentioned uh, about air circulation and filtration must be addressed uh, and more. Um, uh, what, what is the plan uh, for testing among students and faculty there? And I mean fast turnaround testing. A test that gives me a result in seven or 14 days is useless. Uh, what is the plan for contact tracing? Uh, under what conditions would you close one of those schools uh, if there are determined to be spread uh, within the school population? Uh, do we have guarantees on staffing for school nursing, um, et cetera, et cetera? There are big questions to answer there. 
And uh, those questions loom large for the entire public school system. And it's why uh, I joined 30 of my colleagues uh, this week um, in sending a letter uh, to the mayor calling for a delay in the opening of our public schools. That absolutely has to include the schools, the K to 12 schools on the Hunter College campus, no question. Uh, so I wanna, I, I wanna say that very clearly. Uh, so I, I, I stand with uh, all of you uh, as, as advocates for uh, the students, as advocates for the staff and faculty to ensure that we do not settle for anything less than the highest possible standards to secure health and safety in these facilities during this pandemic. And I wanna thank you for including me. Proud to stand with you in this fight. Thank you, thank you so much city council member and uh, best wishes to your child who's at CCNY. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we, thank you so much. Uh, we're delighted to have with us also uh, the borough president from Brooklyn, um, Eric Adams, who has been a champion of CUNY and CUNY students in many, many arenas, including uh, fighting the ban on uh, return from, of students in predominantly Muslim countries where we fought together. And uh, he has stood up for CUNY in many situations. So we're really delighted to have you here with us. Thank you very much, borough president. Thank you, and I thank all my colleagues uh, who are not only colleagues in government, but I consider to be friends of, and we have always had a, a strong voice for CUNY, uh, not only as the institution, uh, but CUNY has changed my life. You know, as I enrolled, I'm a two-timer in CUNY, both in uh, New York City College of Technology and John Jay College. Uh, we just want to, I want to add my voice to something that's extre extremely important. Um, and when you look at the faculty and the students, uh, we must make smart, right, and healthy decisions uh, to ensure that we don't have long lasting impacts on the quality of life of those who are providing an educational opportunity uh, for the young people who are there. Our uh, staff population, some have uh, comorbidities already dealing with pre existing conditions. And we don't want to aggravate uh, those conditions. Uh, coronavirus is real, and it is a formidable opponent. And in the days I've spent moving throughout this borough and watching uh, how it has devastated the lives of so many people, we should not continue to aggravate that. We have to make the right decision for the entire CUNY uh, team. These are not just college students, they are family members. Um, and I'm really concerned if we move uh, in a rapid fashion and not make the right move. So you have my support. And I just wanted to add my voice to this important call. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Borough President. Thank you. And I think what you say about acting with foresight, there's a chance now to get it right. We don't want to have regretful hindsight uh, having uh, seeing CUNY make the wrong decision. There is a chance to get it right. And that's why we're here today. It's still a chance to do the right thing. Um, before we turn to uh, our student speaker, I wanted to say that uh, Gail Brewer, the uh, borough president from Manhattan also had hoped to be here and uh, turned out she couldn't make it, but she sent us a statement of her strong support and she's always been with us. And, and I'm especially glad to have uh, uh, Gail Brewer is the borough president speaking up because uh, of the Hunter Campus Schools um, being in her, her borough. So um, thank you to all the elected officials. Um, so now we'll go over to a student, uh, to Giovanni Piquant. And Giovanni is one of the student leaders. She is the vice chair of the University Student Senate working on legislative issues and a tireless and eloquent advocate um, whom I've had the pleasure of working with a lot. So uh, welcome Giovanni. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having this. I want to thank the PSC for shedding light on in this important cause. Um, as we know, Councilmember Mark Levine, many people um, have spoken about the reopening of CUNY, the concerns for faculty and staff and students. And I stand in solidarity with the PSC sentiments in regards to making sure that all buildings are safe and we know that they are safe in all aspects and there's due diligence and ensuring that process is kept up to par. Um, we cannot have people going into these buildings if they're not clean, if they're not safe enough to go in there. Um, and, you know, I really want to talk about the student perspective here. 
as the reopening of CUNY starts, many students understand that it is not safe enough to be on campus due to coronavirus. But um, I really want the city and the state, and our, we have some elected officials here on to know, uh, many students are concerned. Many students are unemployed. They're housing insecure. They're food insecure. Support services, mental health needs are a huge, huge factor that it will be coming to play at the start of next week on Wednesday when we start our academic um, semester. CUNY is also imposing a tuition hike that is still on the floor. Many students cannot fathom to think that CUNY will be raising tuition in this time. These are the concerns students have. They're out of jobs, coronavirus, they don't have the support that they need, mental health concerns. These are the students that are reaching out to us and letting us know what's going on. They don't have any help. You know, elected officials like to say, well, we support CUNY, we love CUNY. We need elected officials to show up. We need people to show up to put higher education at a priority. We cannot move forward and reimagine New York City and move New York City into this new, new, new decade or new movement that we're going into without putting the City University of New York at the forefront. We are the, we are the ones that keep New York City together. It is important that we make sure that higher education is a priority. Our adjuncts are getting fair and equal paid living wages. Students are going to a university where there is support and services for them. Uh, the mayor was going to cut ASAP. We have a pandemic, but we also have a racial injustice issue crisis that is going on, which is another pandemic. Um, and even in this press conference, you know, I would have personally loved to see, you know, black adjunct professors because they are disproportionately hit differently with these causes. It is extremely important that we also understand the disinvestment of the City University of New York affects 80% black and brown students. It is so important that we understand the students who are struggling, who are going into this new academic semester. They don't have any mental health counselors, not many on campuses. The um, wait time is extremely long. Students are going through a lot and how are we going to help our students sustain? How are we gonna give students the resources that they need to move forward? And I think when we address all of these issues, it needs to be holistic. The disinvestment in our university disproportionately affects our staff, our professors, our adjuncts, our students, everyone, um, our childcare centers. And it is so important right now as we move forward and many decisions are being played, um, ensuring that people do not have to go back on campus with not proper ventilations, are not on the campuses. I've met a student at York College when we did a tour with a public advocate. There was mold in a classroom and she got asthma. This is the City University of New York that students are going into and it cannot happen. And the way this stops is putting higher education at the forefront, putting black and brown cause issues at the forefront, putting CUNY that serves 80% black and brown students at the forefront. And this is how we can move over as New York State. So I wanna thank the PSC for having us here with the Student Voices. We'll continue to fight hard. We're gonna to continue to fight this tuition hike because I truly, I'm calling on all the members of the board, they need to vote no. If they can vote in a tuition hike right now, this really shows um, who they are and what, what they think higher education means for black and brown students. So I wanna thank the PSC. Thank you to President Barbara Bowen and everyone here today. And uh, we'll keep fighting and students will never be defeated. All right. Thank you, Giovanni. That's great. Uh, I, I want to say uh, I'm so glad Giovanni brought up the tuition increase that's on the table. The PSC has issued 10 demands to the CUNY administration um, that we uh, are calling on them to fulfill by August 26th. And one of those demands is no tuition hike and no additional student wellness fee. Uh, the PSC stands with the students and for the students in saying this is not the time for more racist austerity. Um, and that's, uh, we already heard from others here today that a part of the problem that we're facing in terms of health at CUNY is under, uh, under investment is the policy of austerity. Austerity is not going to get us out of this crisis. And uh, this is not the time to further privatize the cost of public higher education by putting more of the burden on students. So the PSC, as much as we stand for the health needs of our own members, as much as we stand against the fact that CUNY uh, laid off 3,000 adjunct faculty and staff and we are fighting to bring them back, we are also standing with students uh, to say there's got to be a different vision for CUNY and health and safety where you work has to be at the center of that vision. 
So thank you so much, Giovanni. Uh, we're now gonna turn to uh, the two speakers from the Hunter Campus Schools uh, to talk about the urgency there and um, the demands we have at Hunter Campus Schools. So we'll, um, we'll start with Tina Moore, who is the PSC's chapter leader at the Hunter Campus Schools and a, uh, a teacher there. Thank you, Tina. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. My uh, my name is Tina Moore, as Barbara mentioned, and I want to thank Barbara for um, having us and highlighting the campus schools. Um, I'm the chapter chair for the campus schools, but first and foremost, I'm a teacher, and I'm a teacher among the faculty at the campus schools that wants nothing more uh, than to get back to teaching our students in person. Uh, but our building, which is fondly referred to as the brick prison, is just not ready. It has a terrible design where almost no classrooms have windows, an HVAC system that can't even handle the state-of-the-art MERV 13 filters, which you heard uh, Mark Levine describe, which I believe also are vital to minimizing the spread of the virus. Uh, there's actually still construction going on, which Barbara Bowen alluded to. And when it's finished, come September, they expect students and teachers to be in the building while they will spend a few weeks conducting tests of the new system to assure its safety. So we have to be there while they're making sure that it's safe. No report, no documentation surrounding the construction project has been given to us to show that the building is safe to return. And the union has definitely asked for that documentation. We have also asked to have an independent, independent, one that's agreed upon by the union um, party come into the building to conduct a walkthrough to inspect the building and that request is also denied. Um, no ev evidence has been given that the building is safe and we are expected to just trust an administration that has already kept us in the dark. Uh, the New York State Education Department guidelines, which Barbara also talked about, mandate that the administration engage with many stakeholders, including but not limited to the union, when formulating a reopening plan. Their reopening plan has been dictated to the teachers and the union, despite repeated requests by the union to meet, to engage in the conversation. The parents have been given limited information throughout this whole process and have been lied to by omission. <clears throat> we have asked the administration, um, we ask that the administration ask the state for an exemption to in-person learning, and that we go fully remote until we can ensure a return uh -oh. <laughs> I just got cut off in the middle of talk. No, you're there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry, my thing is like reconnecting. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so where was I? We want um, to go fully remote until we can ensure a return. Uh, we're having some trouble with Tina. Tina's had some difficulty. There, there you go. Um, maybe what we could do is go over to Alex Epstein and come back to Tina when she can uh, reestablish the connection. Um, so sorry, Tina, but we want to hear very much want to hear the end of what you were saying. Uh, but we'll, we'll go over uh, to Alex Epstein uh, and then come back to you, Tina. Um, Alex is a graduate of the Hunter Campus Schools and is also an advocate on um, uh, safety and public safety uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, we'll let him speak for himself. Go ahead, please, Alex. Thank you, Barbara. So uh, to introduce myself briefly, I'm a PhD student at the Rockefeller University on 66th and York, uh, and I study how to inactivate coronavirus on medical masks using ultraviolet light. And I also volunteer with the COVID-19 Working Group New York, which is a collective of scientists and activists fighting to improve New York's coronavirus response. None of this would have been possible if I hadn't graduated from Hunter College Elementary School in 2008 and Hunter College High School in 2014. Hunter made me the person that I am today. I especially want to thank Hunter's dedicated faculty and staff who patiently and lovingly educated and supported me for 13 years. They taught me to think critically and draw conclusions based on evidence. They taught me to be an effective speaker and writer. And most importantly, they taught me that we all have a duty as citizens to fight for the truth and for what is right. 
I am deeply disappointed that today I have to apply these lessons to Hunter itself. I was shocked and horrified to hear from some of my beloved teachers and from current Hunter students that they have been denied a significant role in planning their own safety. I was alarmed to read a reopening plan crafted behind closed doors by the CUNY and Hunter administrations that from a scientific perspective was clearly unsafe. The faculty and administration have received my report based on the best scientific evidence and guidelines showing that Hunter's focus on fall plan has critical flaws and could put Hunter students, faculty, and staff at serious risk of contracting COVID-19. The plan does not meet standards laid out by Harvard School of Public Health and the National Academy of Sciences for school reopening. As you've now heard, coronavirus spreads mostly in poorly ventilated indoor spaces, and our building has almost no windows, and its ventilation system is so old that it cannot accommodate filters that remove airborne virus. And yet, Hunter plans to take even fewer precautions than the New York Department of Education. The DOE is keeping students in cohorts of nine to 12, but the Hunter plan allows for 24 students in one windowless room. What makes this totally unbelievable to me is that the Hunter administration and Hunter administrators pushing this plan are former teachers and longtime members of the Hunter community. And I had close personal relationships with them. I remember Elisa Siegman, who drove my robotics team to and from Washington, D.C. in a 15-seat van and cleaned up after a student got car sick. Oh. I remember a Tony Fisher who sat in the back of our classrooms every morning to make sure we were getting a good education. And I remember a Dawn Roy who introduced me to my sixth grade buddy on my second week of kindergarten at Hunter. But I cannot reconcile these memories with a planning process that excluded teacher input and a plan that is patently unsafe for students, faculty, and staff. I can only think, to quote a letter from my 10th grade history teacher, Martha Curtis, that our administrators have, through overwork and the strains of the pandemic lockdowns, lost their minds. Ms. Siegman, Dr. Fisher, Ms. Roy, and the Hunter College and CUNY administrations, if you're watching this, please, urgently change course. Stop and look at the damage that this plan is doing to our community. I cannot imagine that you really want a Hunter where students and teachers rightly feel unsafe every moment that they are at school. I cannot think that you want a Hunter permanently deprived of a large number of faculty, including some of my favorite teachers who will likely retire early rather than risk their health in our poorly ventilated building. And I do not believe that you really want more students, staff, faculty, or vulnerable parents and relatives, disproportionately from disadvantaged groups that have borne the brunt of this disease, to get sick and die from COVID-19. I know you're under a lot of pressure, but please don't forget the lessons that you taught thousands of students like me. The truth and the right thing to do here are very clear. Scrap this unsafe plan, let teachers spend their time preparing for remote learning rather than fighting for their safety. Work with the union to install and thoroughly test much needed repairs and upgrades to the building and rebuild trust by crafting a new reopening plan with real input this time from faculty, staff, students, and public health experts. Only when all of that is done can Hunter really reopen in a safe manner for all of the members of its community. Thank you so much. Wow. Great. Thank you, Alex. That's terrific. Uh, so now we see what you do at Hunter College School, Tina. Now we see how you educate students and how important it is uh, that we support that work and keep them safe. So uh, let's turn it back over to Tina so you can uh, finish your remarks. Yes, I was just going to say the teacher always does it better than the student. Uh, no, no, no. Other way around. <laughs> the student always does it better than the teacher. Anyway. Um, I was just, just going to finish by saying that these times are stressful enough and now parents are being asked to send their students to a building um, where the potential for the coronavirus to thrive um, and spread is a real risk. And why take that chance and risk the lives of our students, our parents, our teachers, grandparents, all of our loved ones. Instead, let's use this time that we have before the start of the school year to work on a plan for remote learning 
that can benefit all of the students in the best possible way. Um, Jennifer Robb, please hear our plea and opt for safety and let's work to do the best job we can to teach our students remotely. Thank you um, again. And sorry that was for my technical difficulties. Don't worry, it was great. We were able to hear you, Tina, thank you. Thank you for your work there. And now as our last speaker before we call on the press, um, and I know some of you have questions, um, our last speaker is Cindy Bink, who is a director of counseling at CUNY and also the leader of our very large chapter of the higher education officers who work uh, on CUNY campuses and who are uh, who could are potentially very vulnerable in this moment. So really important to hear from Cindy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Um, as Barbara said, I am the chapter chair, the cross campus chapter chair of higher education officers series, which is called HEOS. So I'm going to say that in my presentation and you know that means the staff of the professional staff of the PSC and within CUNY. My full time job, though, is the director of counseling services at City Tech in downtown Brooklyn. And our chapter is about 5,500 members from every campus. I'm gonna talk, and I am not talking about any specific person, place, or thing, but a general view of the entire university. So because our jobs as HEOs are in physical offices, HEOs are in buildings for longer hours than other groups. We see and experience more problems related to crumbling buildings than other employees simply because we're in the building more. It's hard to prove, but we know we get sick because of being in those buildings. Respiratory issues are the number one complaint. Our, our HEO chapter also represents more people of color than any other PSC chapter. We are a major part of the full-time office staff. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I wonder if these buildings would have been better maintained, especially our office spaces with more funding if our membership was whiter. And I know that's hard to hear, but I really believe it. Many of our students, staff, and faculty have lost parents, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, and uncles. And at the same time, our students have been working hard to stay in college. CUNY HEOs were struggling as well, but they stayed connected to their work and students so that we as CUNY could survive. HEOs are the backbone of CUNY. We're educated professionals, many of us with advanced degrees. We work in every office that keeps the college running. We're counselors helping students to deal with mental health issues, college issues and adjusting to college, including the issues around COVID. We evaluate and process applications in our admissions office, transfer office. We manage financial aid. We calculate class enrollment, grade reports, and transcripts in the registrar. We deal with billing in the bursar's office. We manage payroll, purchasing, and we are even in HR. We help students selecting the right majors and classes to match their goals and place them in jobs. We prepare students for the classroom through orientation programs, veteran services, and student activities. We also manage campus crisis and intervene to protect the learning environment for everyone through judicial affairs. We are everywhere from the building architects to the accountants. So why are we so concerned about trusting CUNY management that it's safe to return to campus? Well, when COVID hit, many of us worked on campuses when other campuses had already closed. It wasn't uniform. Faculty and students, though, were sent home because the college said it was no longer safe for them to be there. But HEALS were told we had to stay. And if it wasn't for the PSC working day and night, we, have, we would have not gotten home, most of us. Many in the CUNY leadership waited for the governor to make the call. So we remember when CUNY did not place our health above all else. When we got home, many of us were offered very little support. We were told, get online, get trained to go online, go to WebEx, Microsoft Teams, you fill it in, new app, new platform, get it done. Some of us experienced supervisors who tried to micromanage us from home, interrupting our daily work with crazy directives to record our every action in weekly reports, written reports. On top of all this, many of us are still using our own personal computers and our phones to do our jobs. 
but we managed and we are getting better. But we remember how we were treated. And now we're asked, we're, we, are, we run the risk of going back prematurely and we're, we do not trust that the college is prepared and concerned about our health. CUNY leadership often denies we have building problems. Now with the pandemic, they want us to trust them that campus, the campuses will be safe and they don't wanna negotiate our return. Bathrooms that don't work, no soap or water, bursting pipes, rat infestation, black mold, poor ventilation, cold classrooms, and superheated offices. That's what we faced. And every time the chancellor writes an email vaguely referencing our return, I get calls from HEOs and it goes something like this. I'm afraid of losing my job. And if I have to go back, I'm really scared. I don't want to put my family at risk, and I know I can do this work remotely. I know that the college will say it's safe, but we know that it's not. They say it's safe all the time. HEOs and CL CLTs, I have to mention CLTs even though they're not in my unit. Um, Senator Glick mentioned labs. Those are where the CLTs are. That's where the CLTs are. HEOs and CLTs should not be sent back to campus where a college is saying it's not safe for faculty and staff to be there until it is safe for everyone and is not safe for anyone. By sending HEOs or even CLTs back, it sends the message that we're dispensable and we are not. Because of past experience, we need CUNY to negotiate our return with the PSC. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, now I, I know that we have questions from the press and I think uh, Tiffany's gonna lead off with those. So thank you all for speaking and also all of you for listening um, at today, uh, such important subjects. So uh, Tiffany, um, uh, you're gonna lead off. Yes, hi everyone. So uh, thank you, uh, Jean uh, Grassman for answering two of the questions from the press and the, uh, the Q&A tab already. So we're gonna start with uh, Greg McQueen. Uh, to your knowledge, does CUNY have any plans to use outdoor space for other or, or other alternative spaces for in-person instruction or any, on any of their campuses? Uh, Jean might want to answer that. I don't know of any plans to use outdoor space um, at CUNY. Um, I haven't read all the plans. We haven't been given all the plans. Um, so I don't know if they have made that um, a possibility. So I'll turn that over to Jean, if you would. Can we unmute Jean? Okay, thank you. Um, actually, at Hunter Campus Schools, they, did, they have spoken about using outdoor space. But, um, and I know a lot of schools, a lot of schools have quads, so you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that has come up in the discussion. But that's a, that's a very limited and a very temporary solution because a lot of functions, you know, you just heard from Cindy, are really office-based functions. They can't really be done, you know, they can't be done outside. And admittedly, maybe that wouldn't happen for a while. But um, there's all, you know, it's also New York, so there's weather and there is, um, you know, the season. So uh, uh, it's, it, you know, we have to come up with other solutions. Thank you. Great. Uh, the second question we have is from Nick Garber from the Patch. Would the PSC consider a work stoppage if its demands are not met? Um, thanks for the question. Um, in July, when we put out these 10 demands of CUNY and put out a deadline of August 26th, we said as a union, and one of the demands is the safety and negotiating, Cindy said, negotiating with the PSC and making sure the buildings are actually safe. Uh, another is no tuition increase for students, and there are others. Um, and when we put those out in July, uh, we announced on behalf of the union's executive council uh, that all options would be on the table if those demands are not met including all legal options, uh, you know, to, do, to do legal action, which we are in the midst of. Uh, we have filed some uh, motions for temporary restraining orders on campuses where people have been called back and it's not safe. Uh, legislative, we're launching new legislation, media work, uh, work with our members, votes of no confidence, and including preparation for a strike. 
So yes, that option is on the table. Um, we think that there are ways to avoid uh, forcing us to take that option, um, but we are a union. We understand thoroughly what the consequences are in New York State, um, but uh, we are certainly, it's certainly legal to consider and to um, discuss that preparation for a strike. We have taken a strike authorization vote before, and uh, we are calling on CUNY to take the actions they can take, which are right within reach, delay opening in buildings that are not safe. And do not expect us simply to take CUNY's word for it that they're safe, because we're tired of taking their word. This is a university that couldn't get soap and water in bathrooms before the pandemic. This is a university that had no running water uh, in whole buildings on certain campuses. This is a university that had years where the drinking water was contaminated at the School of Professional Studies. And still, we and the union had to take the steps to force uh, remedial actions on, that, on those unsafe conditions. So don't ask us to take CUNY's word that it's safe. Uh, so there is a solution, which is to have verifiably safe buildings and not to ask anyone to go into a work site that is not safe until it can be verified independently or through our inspection of building by building, room by room, as Jean said, that that building is safe. So yes, the option's on the table, uh, but the, the question is really up to the CUNY administration if they're going to do the right thing now and they still have a chance to do it. You're on mute, Tiffany. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Our next question is from Naisha Rose. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Will there be more weekend classes available for CUNY students? And she is from Labor Press. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Will there be more weekend classes available? Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know. The answer. I know that we do, uh, CUNY offers classes at a huge range of times. Um, Cindy, as a counselor, might know the answer to that. Uh, I guess it could be seen as a solution to uh, stretch out the number of people so that there are uh, fewer people congregating at one time. Uh, Jean may know, I have not seen that in any of the plans I've read uh, to have more weekend classes. Um, Jean, is there any, do you know anything about that? Um, not specifically, uh, you know, a lot of campuses are initially starting with uh, basically online classes. And so a lot of those classes are asynchronous. So that, you know, so, you know, there is really no, no time frame for that. But I know of the 6% classes that are being offered, I don't know whether there are plans to, you know, shift some of them to the weekend. That would certainly be a good idea. And I know students like weekend classes if they're working full time. We just don't have that information right now. Um, but let us uh, see if we can get that and um, and try to uh, get back to you, Naisha. Thank you. The next question we have is from Ari Paul Clarion. For Giovanni, what kind of organizing are students doing? or considering doing if CUNY reopens too quickly or unsafely? I think Giovanni had to leave the call. Um, is that right? I think, uh, yeah, I think Giovanni had to leave the call probably to go do student organizing. Um, so I know the students are, are working very hard and especially organizing against uh, tuition hike um, and for investment. And um, I know that that's a big part of the organizing that they're doing. They've also been doing a huge amount. I'll just speak for them for a second. Um, Tim Hunter, who's the head of the student government and Giovanni and their whole uh, crew, they've been doing a huge amount of service to other students. Um, service that really should be provided as a public service. I mean, it's beautiful that they do it, but there should be public service. They have been doing work uh, they get those calls about students who have food insecurity, who have been evicted, uh, who are in really desperate trouble, whose parents have died. And when we talked about the number of 
deaths at CUNY, uh, we talked about the number of faculty and staff deaths. We don't know yet, and I certainly don't know the number of student deaths, and I'm sure it's going to be devastating when we hear that. Um, so the students have been thrust into roles that they have risen to, um, but that they shouldn't have been asked to do. So yes, I know students are organizing and we'll try to uh, get more from Giovanni to be able to respond. Yes, uh, Ari, we can connect you with Giovanni. Uh, the next question is from Crystal Lewis, the chief. I was wondering if CUNY has announced how many students and staff are allowed in rooms, especially since there may be a wide range of classroom sizes, like labs and lecture halls, like the K through 12 public school system has. Um, I think we should call on Jean and then maybe go back to Alex, because I think one of the very important things Alex talked about was uh, that the Hunter Campus Schools plans and their overly large groupings of students in these pods or groups. So uh, start with Jean and then maybe go over to Alex. Jean? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick answer for that, which is, uh, the uh, so a, a lot of the the capacity is really based on six foot distancing, although in the CUNY guidelines that was sent out, they actually do have some provisions for doing some more sophisticated capacity based on the ventilation, and um, we like that. However, the degree to which the individual campuses are actually taking CUNY's own recommendations is, is questionable. So, um, so I'll leave it to that. And I, I, if Alex has anything to add, um, please step in, Alex. Great, okay, thanks. Alex? Yeah, so uh, to speak specifically to the Hunter College uh, Campus Schools reopening plan, um, basically, they have floor plans of all the buildings and each room had, is uh, designated as either instructional or non-instructional and has a maximum number of students that it can occupy, which I believe is based on six foot distancing. Um, based on what uh, Jean said about airborne transmission of COVID-19, obviously six foot distancing is not sufficient indoors to protect people. And one of the most important things in keeping schools safe, we think, is cohorting, which means you keep the same, ideally about nine to 12 students together all day, and they don't come in contact with other students. So if one person gets sick, you don't have a school-wide risk of school-wide outbreak. And so the plan has several rooms that have much higher occupancy than that. I mean, it lists like 100 something students in the gymnasium as a non-instructional space. It's extremely unclear what those non-instructional spaces will be used for, but it seems that they could be used for mixing cohorts, which would be a terrible idea. And also, even in some of the instructional spaces, they've you know, put two classrooms together and they say it can hold 24 but that's twice the size of what a cohort should be. So um, yeah, I hope that helps explain why I think some of the, cap the capacity issues and cohort sizes are one of the biggest problems with the HCCS plan. Right, and I want to add on the, uh, the very good question uh, from Crystal about class size, um, that we've been focused on the public health issues about class size, but there's also a very big pedagogical issue about class size. Um, because CUNY has um, anticipated getting budget cuts and accommodated to budget cuts rather than fighting them and taking that on and opposing further austerity and um, cutting nearly 3,000 adjunct faculty and staff, uh, some colleges have demanded that the class size of the existing classes, the remaining, whether they're virtual or online classes or in person, um, that those classes increase in size. Um, and uh, also, uh, all the research on online classes shows that in fact, to succeed, to enable students to succeed, you need fewer students in an online class than an in-person class. Uh, the recommended number is 12. Um, so I think there's a temptation on the part of some administrators to say, oh, you know, we can cut, we can save money, we'll cut out 3,000 adjuncts and we'll cram 50 students into an online class. That is not a solution. 
that is warehousing students. That is a, a violation of CUNY's mission. Um, and it's a, a, an imposition that is setting students up to fail and setting faculty and staff up to fail. Um, so I think it's important, Crystal, to raise that issue of class size and it has ramifications uh, that are public health ramifications that you asked about, but also uh, we have to keep our eye on the fact that just cramming more students into classes and thinking you can do it in an online class is a, another recipe for failure for our students and compounding the effects of racism and disinvestment. And we've got to fight against that. Uh, Tina, you're muted. Uh, sorry, not Tina, Tiffany. Okay, I think I'm off mute now. Yeah. I think we have uh, answered um, all the questions from the press. I sent a message out asking press to submit any final questions, but I believe we covered all of our press questions. Okay, let's just make sure we have. Um, if there are any more press questions, um, what should they do, uh, Tiffany? They could just submit it in the Q&A tab and I will answer them on live, but I believe we cover all of our press questions at this moment. I don't okay. know if you want to take any last minute questions from the uh, audience. We could take uh, just two, two more. I don't want to hold people too long. Um, uh, maybe two questions that have come in for other, from others in the public and our members. Okay, we have one question from the public. Uh, do we know the number of COVID deaths throughout CUNY? What are the plans uh, for high risk groups? Um, okay, uh, the number that we have of deaths of faculty and staff from COVID um, currently is I believe 46. And as far as I know, sadly, as I said, um, that is the highest of any university in the country. Um, we, you know, we don't know the circumstances of every death. We mourn for every one. Uh, there are people I worked with very closely there and people who have um, been union activists and leaders and every single one of them is a person who is mourned and um, whose families miss them, whose loved ones are without them. And for each one, each one is a tremendous loss. Um, we, we don't know in every case the, uh, the circumstances. Um, as I said, we don't know, and I don't know, maybe CUNY um, administration does know, but I do not yet know the total of deaths of CUNY students from COVID-19. And I fear that it will be an unbearable number because many of our students work in the highest risk jobs and couldn't do those jobs remotely during the worst of the pandemic. Our students are home healthcare aides. That's one of the highest risk jobs. Our students are orderlies in hospitals. They're phlebotomists. Uh, our students are working in public transit. They're delivery people in grocery stores. They're grocery clerks. Uh, they're working in other, they're working in childcare. Um, they're working in the jobs that expose them the most. And then their parents are, and they live with their parents or their parents or their uncles, their grandparents. Um, I think uh, that our students, we're going to see a tremendous and a heartbreaking total of deaths among our students and a toll of loss on them, which will, um, you know, be felt not just this year, but will play out in, in years to come and maybe a whole generation. I don't know, Cindy, if you wanted to say something as a counselor. Yeah, I was actually going to say something. I wanted to raise my hand. You know, I'm the director of counseling at City Tech, and so we um, we work a lot with students, and we've been engaging with them around this issue. And many, many of our students have had multiple losses in their their families. I um, I think COVID sort of scared me talking to students because of the amount of deaths. I've had students that have lost three and four members of their family, their close family. And, um, and I, I guess I also want to acknowledge the student um, that talked about, Queen, I think, who talked about the need for support services. We need a lot more support services. Um, we have issues with students that don't have money, that have lost their jobs, that again, don't have food. We need mental health services. And throughout the years, that area has been depleted. Not anything outside of the classroom has been depleted in terms of student support services. So that's another area. If I was going to have another press conference, we should talk about. So um, anyway.
Oops. Yeah, I'll give it back to you, Barbara. Okay, well, thank you, Cindy. Um, I think we need to wrap it up there. We're getting a message from our hosting that we do need to close here. Um, so I want to say thank you. There are 300 people uh, listening and there were higher um, at various points. I think we've had hundreds of people tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, members of the press. Thank you, elected officials, some of whom couldn't stay on to the end. And above all, thank you to our speakers today uh, who are fighters for justice. Uh, for finally uh, recognizing the intersection in this city and this country between racism, public health, justice, and educational justice. Um, and that's what we're standing for here. So together and representing the 30,000 uh, faculty and staff in the PSC and standing in solidarity with the 500,000 students who attend CUNY in some form, uh, we are demanding that CUNY not contribute further to this crisis and that in fact CUNY do the solution that's in its grasp, which is to delay until each building and each room can be determined to be safe and not call the teachers and students at Hunter Campus Schools back into an unsafe situation. We cannot learn in those conditions. So thank you all so much. Thank you, PSC members, all of us, and um, stay safe and stay well. Thank you. <laughs>